became inseparable. That was, that was the anchor Eileen had been looking for. I don't know that she was gay. I think maybe she turned herself that way just to see if that way of life would work for her. The two women lived like nomads, changing homes frequently, from a room in a friend's apartment, to a trailer, to motel rooms, sometimes the woods. By day, Eileen worked the highways, earning a few hundred dollars a week. Once I found out she was prostituting, I tried everything I could to have her stop doing that. Because for one, I, you know, it's not safe. And that I did care about her. But she, she never gave it up. Eileen would come home evenings and weekends. She and Ty would spend time watching television or drinking at a bar. But her anger was always just below the surface. There was numerous times that her and I would go to a grocery store and somebody would look at her wrong and she would just like fly off the handle at them. Like, you know, what are you looking at me for? And, and she was, it was very embarrassing a lot of times. Despite Eileen's temper, Ty stayed with her. Eileen called her her wife and seemed happy to be providing for her, creating their own kind of home. Eileen is so desperate in her life to be loved by somebody. Nobody's ever unconditionally loved her back, and she was just trying to hold on to that. At 33, Eileen Wernos had finally found the companionship she'd always craved, and she would do whatever it took to keep it from slipping away. By the fall of 1989, Eileen Wernos had been working the Florida highways as a prostitute for more than a decade. The wear and tear of her lifestyle was beginning to show on the 33-year-old. To say that the bloom was off the rose would be an understatement. Um, her looks had taken a beating. She did not have the natural tools with which to bring in the clients. Her girlfriend Tyra worked on and off cleaning motel rooms. And the lack of money was causing stress in their relationship. But Eileen was desperate to keep her companion by her side. It seemed like I was all she had. And I felt if I left, she wouldn't have anything. She really felt under threat, big time, that Tyra might leave her and that she would be all on her own again. And she couldn't allow that to happen. I completely lost it, Lord. Hypnotically entranced in our companionship, so deeply lost in its same-sex relationship, causing me then to do the unthinkable. On the night of November 30th, 1989, just outside Tampa, Wuornos was picked up by a 51-year-old electronics repairman named Richard Mallory. He was heading towards Daytona Beach for a weekend of partying. She met him, propositioned him. He said yes. They agreed to have sex. They parked the car in the woods near I-95 and Route 1 and drank and talked until dawn. It was only then that Warnos pulled out the 22 caliber handgun she had brought with her and shot Mallory four times in the chest and back. After rifling through her victim's pockets and stealing whatever money he had, Warnos covered his lifeless body with carpet she found nearby and drove away in his car. When she got home, she told Tyra what she had done. She had told me that she had killed someone and I didn't believe her because of the way she talked about it. I didn't think she had it in her, really. Later that day, Eileen and her girlfriend piled all their possessions into Mallory's car, abandoned their room, and moved into a new place. Then Eileen took the car, methodically wiped clean of fingerprints, and dumped the things that were in the car, covered them with sand, and then dumped the car at yet another site. Police would find Mallory's abandoned car the next day and his corpse two weeks later in Volusia County. But with no leads, the case remained cold. Tyra never went to the police to report her lover's confession and stayed by Warnos's side. I thought at that time that, okay, she has all the frustration out of her system for whatever reason she hated society. 
that she'll be okay. But obviously she wasn't. Obviously it was just the, the turning point and she figured she got away with it once, she would keep doing it. After a six month break, Wernos would strike three more times, robbing and killing David Spears, Charles Karskadden, and Peter Sims in much the same way. She would either find her victims when she picked them up as a John, or she would stand by abandoned cars on the side of the road, and motorists would stop and pull over, thinking that she was female in distress. Once she decided this was going to be a victim, ascertaining that they had the cash that she needed, she was all ready to go. Some serial killers include rape or torture. Uh, in this case, uh, Eileen included robbery. She was making money. She would go home with these bills of money and wave them at Tyra and say, look, now I can pay the rent. Look, now we can party. Everything's going to be all right. I was afraid of her after a while that if I tried to leave that she would, you know, do something. The string of murders baffled the police. At first, they weren't even certain they were dealing with one killer. The fact that we did not catch her is simply because she was unique in her style, that she was a female, that she did uh, leave the body away from the car, and, and it made it hard to put it all together. On July 4, 1990, Warnos had a close call when she and Tyra were involved in an accident while driving a car she had stolen from her fourth victim. We were riding out through the country. I guess I was going a little fast around a turn and rolled the car. The women were unharmed, but when help arrived, Eileen realized the accident could mean trouble. Eileen then wrenched the rear license plate off with her bare hands and threw it into the bushes. When one of the fire rescue people approached the females, the female was belligerent to her and they ran off. I probably had my suspicions about that it could be a vehicle of someone that she murdered. But I never questioned her about it because, like I said, you know, you don't want to make her mad. Police quickly learned that the car was registered to Peter Sims, who had been reported missing three weeks earlier. But they were unable to track down the two women, who had already hitchhiked their way back to Daytona. A drawing was done at that time of the two of them. The police were trying to weigh the benefits of getting the drawings out there against the fear that it would tip off the women and they would run. So they were in one local paper, and that was it at that time, and nothing happened.